Let's have, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time together and bless us as we go about studying your, your uh, word and in particular looking at the gospel according to Mark. Uh, open our eyes so that we can see, open our minds so that we can understand, and open our hearts so that we can apply it. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. 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 Uh, before we, we look at the, the scripture itself, um, and a lot of what we'll do today is sort of introduction, introduction to Mark, because I think there are certain things that are important to know about the gospel before we, uh, we kind of dig into what's going on. Uh, and even before we do that, I've got a, a, a situation that I'd like you to, uh, to think about and um, to sort of reply to. I want you to, to imagine that uh, there's a fire in town, there's been a fire in town, and a house is, is burning, which is a terrible thing. Okay, so you've got a house that's burning. You hear sirens and you go over and you see this house, house burning. Now, let me, let me ask you, that's, that's the situation. How would you, how would a person describe that fire? How would you describe, first, how do you think you would describe a fire that's maybe in your neighborhood or around on the road? Uh, how would you describe a fire in a, in a house? What would be some things you might say to describe it? Devastating. Okay, so devastating, this is a devastating thing. What else? Um, what would be some things you look for or focus on? Uh, emphasize. Make children. children okay, you'd be, you'd be concerned about yeah. children, whether there were children in there. What else? Well, Alice has lived through that with Brandy's place burn. Okay. So she would, I think, be our expert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this isn't this isn't a right or wrong. Well, no, this is I'm just. I want to know what you would, how you would too. see, how how you would see a fire. Now, your experience would would make some differences because you kind of went through it. So what you might be looking for would be different than what I would look at. It was waiting on the fire truck. Waiting on the fire truck. It took forever. Tense, worried. And then when I went in, it was, I tried to put it out. It was kind of behind the TV. So I thought, well, it's electrical. I'll get in, but no, it was in the wall. Okay. So, yeah. so that's, that's how, you would, if you saw a fire, that's what you'd be thinking about. That's what you would be there. Are the kids involved? How did it start? You know, brings back memories, all it was that. My mom, mom and dad's house. So and, <laughs> and real sad memories yeah, right. because you're losing something. Yeah. Now, suppose though you're on the fire department, volunteer fire department, and you're, you're watching it. Maybe you're like an inspector on the fire department. So you look at you know, houses after the fire. What, what are some of the things? How, what are you looking for? How would you describe that, that fire? What would be important as you're looking at it? The Not inspector, you mean? Yeah, if you were an okay. inspector, but you're seeing it burn. You're seeing it burn. Alice is standing there, but the inspector is also standing there looking at it. Alice is thinking about all these memories and yeah. concerns about because she experienced it. What, what, as an inspector, are you looking at? What, how, what are you thinking about? Probably you... seeing how it's burning. Okay. The way it's burning. You're looking at how it's burning, how the fire's burning. The intensity. The okay. intensity of the fire. Mm -hmm. What are they putting the water on the right area? Okay, good. You're, you're looking at how the firemen are responding mm -hmm. to the fire because you know what right area to go. All right? What, anything else, that, if you're the inspector, what are, you, what are you feeling when you see that fire? How it started. Okay, you're thinking about, yeah, you're thinking about how that fire started mm -hmm. because that's, that's part of your job. You're an inspector. Okay, so that's how you're looking at the fire. So Alice is looking at it this way. You got an inspector looking at it that way. What about the next door neighbor? Is standing in the yard looking at the fire, hoping it doesn't hit. His okay, yeah. uh, is is it going to catch? Yes. You know, is is, is a sparks going to fly on my roof? You know, Ember's going to land on my roof, and my house is going to go. What else are you thinking about? Safety, probably. Okay, safety. You know, the loss. Okay, the loss. Okay. The, the loss, not only of the, the house, but, you know, everything that goes, goes along with it. Okay, so that's what you're thinking. What are you feeling? 
Sadness. Okay, real sadness. Yes. Okay, so you're feeling sadness. Not, not necessarily the same kind of sadness Alice is feeling, yeah. but a, a sadness because or of... Or that family, you know. Next door neighbor. Yeah. Okay. You're a 10-year-old kid. You're a 10-year-old kid. What do you, what do you, what do you see? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Gaming systems, go on. <laughs> well, okay, you may be sympathy for the kid, if there's a kid in there, that they're losing. Let's say you don't know, you're just, you don't even know the family. Okay. What do you think? Ten-year-old kid looking at a fire on the street. Wow, isn't that wow. so okay. Okay. <laughs> Wow, okay, they may feel sympathy, it depends on the kid. You know, yeah. you may say, oh man, I got a friend that lived there, or, yeah. you know, so could, certainly could feel sympathy. I might feel... Just... Look at that. Yeah. Look at that burn. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, pyromaniac. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now that's something else entirely too. If you if you're a pyromaniac watching it. <laughs> you're going, oh. Uh, so the what point do you think I'm trying to make? Well, that's the way Mark attempted everything. It was kind of short to the point. It was Bones. Okay. You know the bread and butter of it. It was you know hit on the high spots okay. and go from there. And that's what Matt Mark is doing, right? Mm -hmm. What about Matthew? His is a more okay. He's version. doing something different. Mm -hmm. What about Luke? Same thing. Same thing. What about John? Mm -hmm. All of them are looking at the exact same person, right? Mm -hmm. Same person. But what are they doing? All thinking something different. All yeah. thinking something slightly different. And as they write it down, that's why the Gospels are a little bit different. It's not that one is right and one is wrong. None of them are writing a biography, which is another Greek word. I mean, a biography is the writing of a life. That's what it means in Greek. Uh, they're not writing biography, or they would have called it bi the biography of Jesus. They aren't writing biographies. They're writing Gospels, and we're going to talk about the meaning of that word in just a little bit. So each of them are looking at Jesus Christ from a different angle, which means the stories that they use and they shape, they use and shape to make the point or to reinforce the ideas that they have. And, and the early church, when they put these four Gospels together, the early church knew this. And so they weren't looking at, oh, well, Mark says this and Luke says that. Well, Mark is wrong, so let's throw Mark out. You know, they, they knew they were different, and yet they put all four of them together because they recognized that each of them said something different about Jesus Christ. It wasn't about getting the facts right, which we get all bent out of shape and worry about, but it's, it's getting the truth right, you know, getting the story right. And, and that's what we're looking at when we look at the Gospels, that's what we're looking at as we look at the whole, at all of Scripture. It's, it's the writer getting his point across either through a letter or through poetry or through little stories about Jesus. Okay, so we don't, first thing is I don't want anybody, and you may not do worry about it, but I've, some people do, you know, that the stories are different. Something else that's related to this is one of the things that I'm going to really strongly discourage you from doing. Now, if you want to do it later, that's, that's fine. But I'm going to really discourage you from doing it, is to take other Gospels and shove them in. Well, Mark didn't mention this, but Luke talked about it. So well, we'll take a piece of Luke and shove it into Mark, uh, you know, to make a whole story. You know, and John, my gosh, if you've ever read John, John is, and compare John to Matt, Mark, Lord have mercy. John is like he's talking about something entirely different. You know, you don't, I'm going to discourage you from taking pieces of John and saying, well, Jesus talked to Nicodemus about right after Matthew wrote about, you know, if you, if, when you do that, what you end up doing is you end up, you end up uh, sort of misunderstanding the point Matthew's trying to make when you put some of John in. Uh, good, good example of that is the last words Jesus says from the cross. And, and you realize, we got four Gospels, right? You, you realize there are three different last words that Jesus says, depending on the Gospel. You, you know that, right? In the Gospel of Mark, in the Gospel of Matthew, you know the last words Jesus says. He says, 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes. Boom, yeah. then he dies. Now, what does that immediately tell you? That's in Mark and Matthew. What does that immediately tell you about Mark and Matthew? They're thinking same. They're thinking similar. Yeah. What, what, else, what does it tell you about how they see the cross? If the last words Jesus says is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Boom, he dies. What does it tell you about how they see the cross? Just, yeah, not him. Not him. The importance that should be there isn't. You think why? Okay, how, how, does, how do they see Jesus' experience on the cross? If the last words Jesus says is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, what is... The, okay, the yeah. Jesus... Why, why didn't you save me from this? Right! Yeah. Je, so what they're, saying, what they're saying is Jesus, when he died on a cross, died with... Questions? Yeah. You know, no, no, it why, was a struggle. Why are you doing this to me? Yeah, he had. Son, I, I did everything right. Exactly. Yeah. He had. So that's what. So Jesus dying on a cross in Matthew and Mark. Lord have mercy. This is a horrible event, not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually. Jesus, when he died on a cross, he felt what? Alone. Alone. Now, you look at the Gospel of John. And, and you know the, or the Gospel of Luke, the last words Jesus says from the cross. It's not, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says, to you or into your hands, I commend my spirit. Now, how does it sound? How does that sound? Much if, better oh, much better. You know, is, is Jesus dying in doubt yeah. in, in Luke? Heck no. Jesus is saying, God, I believe in you. I'm, I'm sending you my spirit. A whole different mood. Which tells us not that, you know, as Matt, Mark is writing his stuff down, you know, he just missed that. You know, he was looking somewhere else and Luke got it right. You know, it, it's a whole different view of the cross in Luke. Well, each, I think each man, you have to take in their perspective. Exactly, just like the guys at the fire. You know, you, you look at what's important to them, what point they're trying to make. And in the Gospel of John, his last words are, it's finished. it is it's finished. finished. It is finished. And, and man, when you look at John, that means Jesus' work well, is done. done. That's not a, my gosh, why have you abandoned me? But my job is done. And remember in John, what else is Jesus doing from the cross? He's, He's making living arrangements for his mother. <laughs> yeah. You know, this doesn't sound like a Jesus who is suffering. You know, if he's making living arrangements for his mother, the suffering in John is being reduced because John sees something else going on at the cross. But not Mark and not Matthew. And so that's why it's really important that we don't combine like these last words that Jesus said all of them. Because if you say he said all of them, well, did he die? If he felt if he died alone with fear, then you know what? He can identify with our fear. You know, when we're afraid, Jesus knows what it's like to be afraid. He knows what it's like to be he knows what it's like to be lonely. So when I pray to him, he understands. When I say, Jesus, my wife is living in Weirton, I am really alone. He knows what he what I'm saying. He can identify with it. You know, but he can also identify with God, I can't believe you're so good. You know, I just appreciate you all the time. My, you know, to you I commend my spirit. You know, both are true of Jesus. But we lose that if we shove them all together into one story. You see, we lose the flavor of each gospel. Okay, just want to throw that out for you to think about, uh, at least when we study, if you do that, and I'm going to, you know, everybody's tempted to do that. I'm probably going to say, you know, let's, let's focus on Mark you know, when we feel real tempted to bring in something from the other Gospels. Okay, now, in terms of Mark, and we don't mainly get to a little introduction today, Mark was probably written around the year 70 A.D. 70 A.D. By far, Mark was the earliest of the Gospels. Wasn't any Gospel done earlier. Now, even though Mark is the earliest of the Gospel, it's not the earliest part of the New Testament. What is the, who wrote the earliest parts of the New Testament? Cousin 
even before John. The earliest parts of the New Testament were written by the Apostle Paul. All of Paul's letters were written before the Gospel of Mark. All of them. And, and remember, back in the day, and that's not a shocker, back in the day, you know how people were, had to write? We, they didn't have paper. You know, paper wasn't introduced into Europe until around the 14th century. You know, they, and that was Chinese. You know, Chinese were making paper. Europeans weren't. You know how they, the only way you could write something? You had three choices. Three choices. That's one of them. That's one of them. Only, yeah, only the, the people in uh, uh, Sumeria, uh, they would do it in wet clay. You know, when you see cuneiform, you know, they were doing it in, in wet clay, putting little styluses into wet clay, making, and that's how, that's how they wrote. Now, what's the disadvantage of writing in wet clay? You know, it's, yeah, yeah, it's hard to come up with a book. <laughs> you know, you get, you get a hernia moving your book. You know. But how did they, like, learn to write? Oh, good, good. Wet clay, we'll get there. Wet clay was one way. Not very good. Or painting on stones like hieroglyphics and stuff. Can't take them in. Can't take it with you. Okay. You could do that. You what's that? Scrolls. Oh good, good. good. Scrolls. Now, what were scrolls made of? Animal skins. Well, it could be. You know, so some people were writing on vellum, which is which is animal, the skins of animal. Now, what's the problem with writing on animal skin? They dry, they shrink. They dry, they shrink. They stink. Some, they stink. <laughs> Just like some wrote on feathers, wet feathers. Uh, okay. no, 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 no. They wrote with wet feathers. Uh, they, they, they would shrink and dry and, and do crap. They were also, it was also really expensive, you know, to write on vellum. So you didn't have a whole bunch of it out there. I mean, paper, I mean, we're using fiber from, from trees or, or linen or anything. Anything that's fibrous you can use to make paper. Vellum, I mean, you had to use animal skin. That's, that's pretty expensive. So you didn't use a lot of vellum. Most scrolls weren't made of vellum, but some were. Most people back in the day here weren't using wet clay, because that's just inconvenient. Weren't using animal skins, because that was way too expensive. They were using what was called papyra. Oh, yeah. And papyra. And do you know what papyra was? I'm not sure, rice paper? It was, yes, yeah, but it wasn't really a paper. What it was, was you take the, a reed and cut a reed, and you know, reeds have skin. And, like an onion, you know, you cut a reed, you'd peel the, the skin, you'd put it down, get it nice and flat, and then glue another piece of reed next to it. And then another one, and then another one, and then another one. Wow. That, was, that was papyrus. You know, easy to write on, you know, wasn't like clay. You know, wasn't animal skin. You didn't smell. You didn't have to worry about curing it, that kind of stuff. Problem with papyrus was, what, what was it just, what I described, what's the problem with That's that? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Man, you thought plucking a chicken was hard. <laughs> you know, cheese Louise, try getting papyrus. You know, suppose on the farm you were doing that. You know, gluing reeds together. You know, that's, that's pretty tough stuff. And it was, it was time consuming, which means it was expensive. You know, that's why you had scribes. They had scribes that wrote because scribes could write in a tiny little, a tiny little hand, little tiny, because you wanted to get as many letters as you could on papyrus. Nobody, I wouldn't be, you wouldn't be writing stuff on papyrus. I mean, if you had it, it was so valuable, you didn't want to waste space. Yeah. In fact, if you look at the ancient, and all the New Testament is put on, the earliest is on papyra, because like I said, paper's not introduced until the 14th century. You know, we don't have paper. Uh, you know, it's, there are, there are like sheets and only letters. That's all it is. No space for words. Just all letters. Lines and lines of letters. Uh, because you couldn't, putting spaces between words was what? Waste of space. Waste of space. So you had just letters written, line after line after line. And that's what you needed to scribe to write it. You needed to scribe also to do what? 
translate. to translate it. And that's why scribes were so important. You know, they were not only the, the people that like knew the law, they could write and like understanding Morse code, they could look at these lines and figure out where the words started and ended. And understand, you not only didn't you have any words, you didn't have any punctuation. So you don't know when sentences start, you don't know when sentences end, you don't know if there's question marks, you don't know. Because it's not in the ancient papyrus. Anyway, Mark is written is written in 70. Now that is way before the the other other gospels. If you look at the gospels, Luke is probably written around 90 uh, AD. Uh, and John maybe 85, Matthew about the same, 90 AD. So Mark is, is really, really, really early. Now, one of the ways we can, we can know that is there are things that Luke and Matthew mention that has happened that Mark doesn't because Mark probably didn't know about it because it hadn't happened yet, like the destruction of the temple. The temple was destroyed in the year 71. And both Matthew and Luke talk about the destruction of the temple. Mark doesn't, because Mark didn't know. It, it hadn't happened yet. So Mark can't integrate that into his story. Uh, and so Mark was probably really early. Now, if Mark is early, really early, what, what are some things that we might look at? Or what are some of the things that might be distinctive in Mark? that as we read, we might want to have in the back of our minds. If it, was, if it really was the earliest. That he had recalled things a little. Okay, that, that some of the stories are recent. Even then though, Jesus, when would Jesus have died? Okay, let's say he died before the year 40. Okay. Because let's say he had a ministry of, um, of thir like 30 years. Mm -hmm. Appears as though he, died, he was born before the year zero because uh, King Herod, and we know the story in Matthew about Herod, you know, killing the children and all. Herod died in 4 B.C., so Jesus would have had to have been alive in 4 B.C., would have had to have been, if he was alive when Herod was alive. Uh, so Jesus probably wasn't a strapping 31-year-old. He was probably a 35 or 6-year-old kind of entering middle age. You know, so he wasn't quite as youthful as sometimes we, we, we see or think. You know, he, he was a little, little, probably a little bit older. Older. You mean Jesus? Jesus was, because he was probably older than, than we think. And, yeah. and since Mark and uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke have a one-year ministry, uh, John has three years, but Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have one year, that means he didn't start his ministry until he was in his mid-30s, uh, if it was only one year. So you know, it kind of changes our view of, of, of Jesus. You know, he spent a lot of time not doing this you know, before he actually started. But if Mark is the earliest, not only do we have the stories are a little fresher in the mind, it still, we're still talking about maybe 35 years after Jesus has died, before anybody writes the story, starts writing the story down. Whoa, 35 years, that's a long time. Well, how did the story of Jesus, because we got Paul probably writing in the year 40, 40-ish, between 40 and uh, 55, you know, that's when Paul was active. So he was active before Mark, Mark was written. How, how would the story, but people were becoming Christian before 70, before we had a gospel. How was that happening? What was, what was going on in the early church that would enable people to, to know who Jesus was? It was all story told. Okay, we got, we got stories yeah. being told about Jesus, right? And, and how were those stories being told? Well, the comparable word made it more relatable. Okay, by word, by relatable. Now, we all know that when people tell stories, they are notoriously accurate in retelling exactly <laughs> the story they heard, right? Yeah. You know, that never, ever happens if somebody puts their own spin on a story. <laughs> Heck no. 
<laughs> Let me tell you about my childhood. <laughs> the, the, so we got these stories that, and that's why Paul has such a horrible time in some of his churches because we got other ministers, and there's no basis for you know we can go we can go and say well this is what the Bible says. There ain't no Bible, you know there ain't no New Testament. So you can't say well uh, Mark says this because Mark doesn't exist. So, you know, all these stories are floating around. And that's what I want you to visualize. This, whole, this Mark working with a pile of little pieces of paper. He didn't have paper. But these, all these stories that he's trying to shape into some kind of a narrative about who Jesus is. Okay, one other thing to, to follow away with, with um, Mark is that, and we know, again, by looking at Mark, that Mark is probably writing to a Gentile church. All, everything in the New Testament were written to Christians. You know, none of them were written like Gideon, like a Gideon Bible. They weren't written and put in a, a pagan hotel. You know, they just weren't. They were written for Christians. So Christians can learn about the one they, they worship. And, and Mark, being, uh, being really early, uh, we see about 90% of Mark in the Gospel of Matthew. About 90% of Mark is in Matthew, and Mark's chronology is in Matthew. Now, what does that, and, and Mark is the earliest. What might that tell you? If Matthew was written somewhere around 90 AD, and Mark was probably written somewhere around 70 AD, and 90% of Mark is in Matthew, Matthew what might that tell Mark, you? That's it. Matthew probably had Mark in front of him. And he was filling, now Mark is a little over eight verses over 15 chapters. Matthew is 28 chapters. So there's a lot more in Matthew than in Mark. But Matthew uses Mark's structure and fills in with extra stuff. So Mark is, Mark is pretty much in that. Now that becomes really interesting, especially when you think about the fact that in the Gospel of Mark, uh, in Matthew, 28 chapters, Three chapters, in, two chapters in Matthew are used, are devoted to the death of Jesus, what's called the Passion, between um, the Last Supper and the cross. Two chapters are devoted to that out of 28, okay? Guess how many chapters in Mark are devoted? Two chapters. Only he's using, he's got 15 chapters in eight verses. What does that tell you about Mark? If Matthew devotes two chapters, and so does Luke, to the crucifixion, two out of 28, Mark devotes two out of 16. What does that tell you about Mark? What he sees as important? Driving at the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Well, the facts, <laughs> but, but what else does he consider? If he devotes two out of 16 to the crucifixion, that the crucifixion for, Matt, yes. for Mark is really important. Yes. For Matthew, it's important, but not as important. For Mark, man, we are going to look for crucifixion. And remember, Mark had, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So evidently the suffering is going to be a big deal in the Gospel of Mark, more so than we see in the other three Gospels. So as we read Mark, we want to have that kind of filed in the back of our, our head. Gentile church, because what Mark does is he defines Hebrew words. You know, when, you, when he runs across a Hebrew word, he defines it. You know, he says, this is what the word means. Well, that means he's writing to people who what? Don't know Hebrew. <laughs> you, know, you know, they don't know Hebrew. Therefore, they probably aren't, they aren't Jews. They aren't Jewish Christians. They're probably Gentile Christians, and that's why he has to define the words. Uh, Matt, he, Mark, What's the difference between Gentile and Jew? Okay, great question. The Jews were the people of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You know, they were the followers of, of that God. They saw themselves as God's people, special, mm -hmm. chosen. In fact, for the Jews, and this is really, really interesting, the, the word for Gentile is the Greek word ethnos. Ethnos, ethnic. When we talk about ethnic, that's where it comes from. Ethnos is a Greek word for Gentile. It's also the Greek word for nations, for the nations. Ethnos is a nation. The United States would be an ethnos, a nation. 
Uh, well, not because we, we've got a lot of different people. France would be an example of an ethnos, a nation. Uh, the Jews believed that you had Jews and then you had the ethnos, the nations. Everybody, so you had Jews and then everybody else. Non-Jews. Well, how did the Jews see Jews and non-Jews? <laughs> Who was better? The Jews thought they were better. Like, duh, they were God's people, right? Okay. So the Jews kind of looked down on Gentiles. They couldn't eat with them. You know, they couldn't hang out with them. You know, Gentiles weren't as good. They just weren't. They just weren't as good. Uh, you know, you didn't want your daughter marrying a, a Gentile. Jeez, not if you were Jew. You, the other way around. Yeah, you, or the other, you didn't want the other way around either. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, Louise. I mean, you couldn't invite them over for dinner because Jews couldn't eat with Gentiles because Gentiles were, you know, lower class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you, you got that right. Uh, so that's how my great grandmother felt about Yankees. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't want her daughter marrying one either. Uh, the, uh, but that's that's what that's the difference between Jews and the Gentiles, and and um, and so th that's the way the Jews viewed it. Now, when we and eventually we'll study it. We got plenty of time. You know that perspective started. That perspective changed. And you know, Paul became the one who brought the gospel to the Gentiles. But initially, the gospel was—I mean, this was to the Jewish. You know, this was intended to the Jewish people. Uh, even the word. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, but this is this is uh, this is to a Gentile Christian audience, which means we got a Gentile church. We got Gentiles that are following Jesus, not Jews, because he wouldn't need to define words to to Gentiles. Okay, so Luke, uh, Mark has a horizontal view of history. <laughs> horizontal view of history. Now that sounds really highfalutin, uh, but it's not, it, it really isn't. A horizontal view of history means you got a past, you got a present, present yeah. and you got a future. future. You got a beginning and you got yeah. an end. And I mean, uh, Mark sees that, Luke sees that, Matthew sees that, Paul sees that, horizontal view of history, has beginning, has an end. John, on the other hand, doesn't. John's presentation is a little different. His, his is vertical, but we're not talking about John. So Luke, uh, Mark sees history as having a beginning and an end, and the beginning is creation, the end is... <laughs> yeah, heaven when Jesus comes back and time ceases to have meaning and right in the middle of history is what? The Christ event. Boom. That separates history into two ages. We got the old age and we got the new age and Jesus stands right in the middle and as you put right in the middle, John the Baptist is on which side of the line for Mark? Boom, on the old side of the line. He's on the, he is the last of the great Old Testament prophets. You know, he, he, that's what he is. But we got history divided right there. Now, one of the things we're going to see in Mark much later, later, probably sometime in the fall, is Mark believes, seems to believe that the end is coming soon. You know, the end is, we're not going to have to wait for the end very long. Paul had that same perspective. You know, that Jesus was going to come back when? Then. Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, he's going to come back tomorrow. So you better be careful. You better be watching, because he could come back any time. Now, 20 years later, when Matthew is writing his and Luke is writing his, are they, do they still have the same perspective after 20 years? Well, if they did, you know, they are really patient people. Because in 20 years, he ain't come back yet. And so they start thinking in terms of the church. Mark doesn't talk about the church. Why, why have a church? If Jesus is coming back tomorrow, you don't need a church. If he ain't come back in, in 40 years, you better get together as a group because you may be in for a long wait. And that's fine, but you better, you, 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 you better not be looking for tomorrow him coming back. You better not sell the house and stand in your yard and wait for him to take you because he, ain't, he hadn't come for 40 years. He probably ain't going to come tomorrow. You know? And so you have a whole different perspective in terms of still that horizontal, but a whole different view 
of time. It's not Jesus isn't going to come back immediately. He's going to come back later. And in the Gospel of Mark, we, we kind of know that because if you look at the end of Mark, most people don't know this, realize this. When you look at the end of Mark, Jesus never appears in the Gospel of Mark. There's no appearances of Jesus after the resurrection. Which you say, boom, has to be. Well, there isn't. Mark ends in verse 8 of chapter 16. Now, if you look in your Bible, it'll say two endings. There'll be two, a long ending and a short ending. They weren't written by Mark. Because the language is different, the grammar is different, the structure is different. Whoever wrote Mark did not write either one of those two endings. What happened was somebody looked at it and said, man, I must have lost a page. I better write an ending. You know, because certainly Jesus appeared, which is something else to file away in the early church. People had no qualms about changing words and letters and sentences, you know, in the Bible. If they thought something was wrong, they corrected it. We'll see that, an example of that next week. But so Mark believed the end, focus on the passion of Jesus Christ, believed the end was soon, coming soon, earliest of the Gospels. Next week, what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at the Gospel itself. And in particular, we're going to look at chapter 1, and I'm telling you right now, but I'm not going to tell you how, <laughs> Next, when we look at chapter 1 and we'll only probably cover half of it through John the Baptist the most important verse in the entire gospel of Mark the, in fact I'll go further the key to the gospel of Mark is in the first chapter you, under, you can understand the whole gospel of Mark by one verse in chapter and that's what we'll talk about next week. Any questions? Did you say Mark preached to the Gentiles? I think Mark is written to a Gentile church. Okay. Is written to a non-Jewish church. I thought Paul was the first to preach to Gentiles. Well, now, now remember, Paul, Paul did his thing between 45 and about 60. Oh, okay. So by, when Mark writes his gospel at 70, Paul is dead. Paul no longer is alive. You're, you're entirely right. You know, Paul is the one that ends up taking the gospel to the Gentile. It becomes, and eventually, Christianity becomes a Gentile church. You don't have a Jewish church. You know, that ceases to exist for a lot of reasons. But, yeah, you're right. So, the fact that Paul has done his work enabled Mark to write to a Gentile church, which shows that Christianity is still is moving away from Judaism and into a more Gentile environment isn't just in Palestine, it's, it's spreading, which is what the book of Acts is all about, the, the church, the word spreading out. But that's, you're right, and that's, without Paul, we wouldn't have had the Gospel of Mark because there would have been no Gentile church. In fact, all the Gospels, I think, are written to, well, Luke is probably written to a, to a, a, a Greek, a Jew, more Jewish church. Because of their reasons, you know, there's some reasons in it, but probably to a more Jewish church. But certainly John is, and, and Mark and Matthew are, to more Gentile churches. How did they become separate? Jews and Gentiles? Because they didn't like each other. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's it. They, they just didn't like each other. It'd be like Jews. the Protestants and the Catholics. Yeah. They never yeah. liked Jews, John Jews, did, the yeah. Yeah. Jews, did, Jews yeah. didn't like Jews didn't like Gentiles. Uh, you know, Jews didn't like Gentiles. And yeah, John Deere and, and Harvester, you know, try to get them at a party. Uh, you know, the, um, uh, they, they, they just didn't like each other. And, and their view of who they were is, is radically different. Because Jews believed that they were God's people. And therefore, God gave something special, special. to them. You know, they got the first piece of pie. Mm. Or better yet, the second piece. After the first of piece, all it gets all money. chewed out. Yeah. You know, they get the second piece. Yeah. You know, they, they're the ones that, that get the best. Yeah. And, and so that's what they, because they were special. And so Gentiles, Gentiles didn't like that. Gentiles were also being, Jews had this strong focus on God. This one God. And Old, and Old Testament theology, how you view God. Very distinct. Well, the Gentiles who are coming from a whole different background. I mean, they were worshiping 
sticks and trees and statues and stuff. Man, they were bringing a lot of those things into Christianity. They believed in Jesus, but their whole background was in worshiping Roman and Greek gods, worshiping gods. So that was kind of their mindset. Their mindset was a whole lot different than the Jews who had worshiped the God of Israel. You know, and that's the big debate in Acts. Uh, the debate was, should a Gentile become a Jew before he becomes a Christian? Do, do you have to get a Gentile to become a Jew and then convert him to Christianity? Or could he convert from being a Gentile to a Christian? And in Acts, that's, Acts 14, that's the big, big issue. You know, whether you can do it. And it's centered around circumcision. Should Gentiles be circumcised before mm-hmm. they can be Christians? Um, and the church met and said no. You know, so then it became a more Gentile religion, which means you were bringing in all these ideas that had nothing to do with what the Jews believed. Nothing to do with it. You know. And so they were, they were different people, and frankly, they didn't like each other. You know, <laughs> yeah. they, just, they just plain didn't uh, like each other. Any other questions? But that's a great question. You know, that's really good. In fact, the questions you're all asking are really, really good. Because I recognize this is kind of new. This is what I'm doing is a little different. But I like uh, it. I, that's, that's what I want to do. Uh, I'm, not going to give you, I'm not going to give you baby food. Uh, you know, we're going, we're, going, we're going to push the envelope a little bit. But by the time you leave, I think you'll understand Scripture a whole lot better. And when you read it, you know, you're going to start seeing things that you may not have seen before because you're thinking about it in a slightly different way. And you have these recorded on online. These I'm this gonna miss two weeks in a row. This is gonna be these are gonna be uploaded. Okay. Yeah. Sometime during the next week I'll upload it. And also normally we didn't look at any scripture but we looked at an outline. Mm-hmm. I'll also have like the passage we looked at. Okay. So that you can read it and, and sort of follow along with the discussion. Yeah. Okay? All right, let's have a word of prayer and then I gotta work. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time together. Bless us as we begin to to learn about you by looking at your word. Uh, Inspire us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.